Well, this morning I invite you to find your Bibles and go with me to the Psalms, Psalm 121 this morning, Psalm 121. Uh, If you are just joining us, we are in the second week of our series called Songs for the Road. Songs for the Road, as we are making our journey with Christ on this road to the cross, this road to Jerusalem, we are using the Psalms of Ascents, the Songs of Ascents, which are Psalms 120 through 134. We're taking a selection of those Psalms as our playlist for this season. Uh, They are accompanying us on this journey with Christ to His cross. And last week, we were looking at Psalm 120, which was a a song of repentance as the psalmist cries out for the deliverance of the Lord to deliver Him from the land of Meshech and from the tents of Kedar, to to deliver Him out of the, the culture of lies and to come into the land of the Lord. And so this morning, we continue that progress, we continue that journey from repentance now to seeing the Lord's help, the Lord's providence for us. And we've been reminded of that in the songs that we've been singing this morning. And so hear the word of the Lord in Psalm 121, which says this, I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. O Lord, we pray this morning that You would allow the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts to be acceptable and pleasing in Your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. We thank You for Your constant help of Your people and for Your faithfulness through generations. Lord, as we reflect on these truths, may you illuminate our hearts to see this truth for us today. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. So as I said, we pick up things this morning where we left off last week. We are in this collection of psalms called the Songs of Ascents, the Songs of Ascents, the the Songs of Degrees, as the King James has it in the title of those psalms. It's a collection of psalms within the Psalter that run from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. It's a collection of psalms within the psalms. And as I said last week, these are pilgrim psalms. They are pilgrim psalms. In other words, they are psalms that would have been used as the the Hebrew pilgrims would have been making their journey to Jerusalem. For all those high festival days in in the Jewish calendar, you have three major major feast days or celebrations that took place in Jerusalem, and and the, the people of Israel would make their pilgrimage from wherever they were, from their hometowns, and they would go up to Jerusalem. They would ascend Mount Zion. And they would go to the temple to offer their sacrifices and to worship the God, the, the God of Israel. And, and so these are, are pilgrim psalms because they are psalms that would have been used on the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. But they are not just for our physical pilgrimages. They are also for the spiritual pilgrim, for the spiritual pilgrimages that we make, the, the journey inward that we all make, the journey toward God. And so these psalms, I think, are especially good for us as we make our own journeys with Christ in the season of Lent, right? As we make that journey with Christ, as He carries His cross up that hill, we can use these psalms of ascents as we make that journey up that hill with Him. Or as Jesus makes His journey from the upper part of Israel to the southern part of Israel, and He goes up the elevation climb to Jerusalem, we can use these these psalms, these songs of ascents, as we make that journey upward toward Jerusalem as well. And so these psalms are not just for physical pilgrimages, but we are also seeing that these psalms are for spiritual pilgrimages, the journey inward, the journey to God. And through these 40 days, we are walking with with Jesus to Jerusalem, walking with Jesus to His cross. It's interesting, historically, the season of Lent 
was always a season of intense preparation for baptism. I'm not sure if you realize that. Uh, as we look through the history of the church and go to the very early days of the church, in the first two or three centuries of the church, the season of Lent was established as a season of preparation for baptism. In the early days of the church, baptism was actually a process that, that took a course of three years of preparation before you could be baptized. It, it was a process that you had to, to go through in order to be baptized, three years. So, for example, you might come to church or be invited to church by a friend or a neighbor or a coworker, and you, you start getting interested in this religion, this faith of Christianity, and you come to worship and you receive the preaching of the Word, but they don't let you come to communion yet because communion at that time was only for the baptized. And so they would dismiss you before you could partake of those sacred mysteries. And, and so you become more interested, and you're wanting to maybe become a full member of the church and become a full-fledged Christian and to submit yourself to baptism. Well, they're going to initiate you into this three-year-long process as you go through a series of instructions over the course of those three years, and as you continue to come to worship and you continue to get more involved in the life of the church and you begin to understand more about this life of Christianity, a three-year process of spiritual growth. And then at the end of those three years, you would come to that, that uh, great 40 days leading up to Easter because baptism always happened at Easter the great Easter vigil, the night before Easter, just as the sun has gone down, around midnight they would gather and then they would announce the resurrection of Christ and they would baptize new believers at the end of those three years. And so in that final year, the final 40 days leading up to Easter would be a season of intense preparation for baptism. 40 days of prayer and fasting 40 days of putting away your sins, 40 days of turning fully to Christ, 40 days of receiving Christian instruction. And eventually, the entire church came to share in this practice of preparation. Though the church had been baptized and the other members of the church had already been baptized, they would stand in solidarity with those catechumens, we call them, who were preparing for baptism. And so the, the other members of the church used this season as a way to put away their sins and to fast and to pray more intently and to read Scripture and to receive instruction in the church. It became a, a season of solidarity with those preparing for baptism. And so it became a season of intense focus on Christian discipleship. And so as we look at the season of Lent, we really can see it as a season of pilgrimage, can't we? We can see the season of Lent as a season of, of journey, a, a season of preparation, a season of, of sacred travel as we make our way toward the cross and as we stand in solidarity with those preparing for baptism. And in this season of Lent, as we see it as a kind of pilgrimage, this collection of psalms are great songs for that, that road. They're great songs for the road. As we saw last week, that song of Psalm 120 was a song for the beginning of the journey, the beginning of the journey which began with repentance, where we confess that we live in the land of Meshech and we dwell in the tents of Kedar, that we find ourselves among places and people that are distant from God, that we find ourselves in the midst of a culture of lies and deception. And we confess that we have participated in those things, that we actually have had a part in that deceit, that we were content to dwell in the land of Meshech, and we were content to dwell in the tents of Kedar, that we were content to, to dwell among places and people that are distant from God. And so at the start of our pilgrimage, we have to renounce all of that. We have to actually acknowledge that our sin and our, uh, our, our, our deception, our participation in those things have led us away from God. We have to acknowledge our sin, and we have to repent and believe the gospel. Repentance literally means to turn around. You're going one direction. To repent then turns in the complete opposite direction. It's a reorientation away from our sin and our orientation toward God. We start off this journey in a new direction. 
And so it's significant, I think, that we began last week with Psalm 120, the song of repentance, the song that cries out for the deliverance of the Lord to deliver us from the land of Meshech, to deliver us from the tents of Kedar, to deliver us from the, the culture, the society of lies, and to deliver us from our own participation in those things. And so we begin that journey with a long obedience in the same direction. A long obedience in the same direction. That's the character of this journey. A pilgrim's journey is a sing, has a single-minded focus. It's oriented toward just one thing. It, it gets rid of the distractions. It removes all the other things that can lead the person away from God. And it has the simplicity of focus, the single-minded focus, the simplicity of putting one foot in front of the other and making that journey toward God. And what that means is always a rejection of the things that take us away from God. Right? If you are walking one step after another toward God, what that means is that you are rejecting all the other things that lead you away from God. The first step is always a rejection of those things, a renunciation, a repentance. And what it shows us is that it's also equal parts escape and adventure. Escape and adventure. Escape because it means leaving the deception of the false self. It means leaving those things behind. It means leaving the deception of our sin and the world of sin behind us. Re renouncing the world, renouncing the flesh, renouncing the devil, which, by the way, are the three things that we renounce in our historic baptism. When somebody comes to baptism in the early church, they make a, a renunciation of those things. Do you renounce the devil, the flesh, the world? But it's also an adventure. So as we escape those things God invites us onto this adventure because each movement away from those things is a movement into the life of God, and the life of God is an adventure. We can imagine what kind of adventure it would have been for the ancient Hebrew pilgrim as he makes his way toward Jerusalem, as he makes his way toward the city of God. You can picture him leaving his field you can picture him leaving his hometown, leaving his village, leaving perhaps some of his family members, and, and he begins this journey toward Jerusalem. You can picture this pilgrim, this Hebrew pilgrim, leaving his town and leaving his fields and making that journey toward Jerusalem, camping out in the fields along the way, camping out under the stars along the road toward Jerusalem. It would have been a fulfilling experience, I can imagine, or, or an inspiring experience, I can imagine, but also full of risk, full of risk. You could have the threats of robbers who would come to steal your possessions. You have perhaps the intense heat of the sun, which could cause sunstroke and dehydration. Perhaps the, the risk of falling or, or getting injured as you take a misstep or you travel on the, the rocky roads up the, the cliffs and around the mountains, it could be a difficult journey. What that shows us, I think, is that sometimes the pilgrim road to God is not what we expect it to be. Have you seen this in your own life? As you begin to turn away from your sins and you begin to turn toward God and you take that first step toward God and you renounce those things that have detracted you away from God or have been stumbling blocks in your path to God, you renounce those things and you think your life is going to get better and better and better and it's just going to be great being on that adventure into the life of God. Sometimes the pilgrim road to God is not what we expect it to be. Or I imagine that's the case for the, the Christian catechumens in the early days of the church as they began that journey in those 40 days of Lent toward their baptism. As they were preparing for baptism, it would have been an exciting experience, right? In 40 days, we're going to be baptized. We're going to belong in full membership to the church. We're going to be able to come and receive communion for the first time. It would have been a powerful experience for them as they prepare for that. And yet, I can picture many of those early catechumens in the early church preparing for baptism, 
finding it to be a road that they did not expect. As they have to fast and pray and read, uh, read and study Scripture, receive the instruction of the church, as perhaps they are engaging these practices and learning more about this, this discipleship journey, that they actually have to take up their cross and follow Jesus daily. <laughs> we have to be reminded, I think, of the hardship of walking the way of the cross. Right? The hardship of walking the way of the cross, so the dangers of following Jesus that these early Christians may have faced, the risks to your life. Many of these early Christians were martyred for the faith or the risk to their livelihood. Many of these early Christians lost their jobs as a result of their faith, or at risk uh, to their reputation or to their relationships that they've had, or the, the risk to being kicked out of their families. There are so many things that would have accompanied them on this journey, and the pilgrim road to God may not have been what they expected it to be. There are challenges to discipleship, putting away your sin and turning to Christ. There are uncertainties in committing your life to this gospel. I love what J.R.R. Tolkien says. He, he says, it's a dangerous business going out your front door. You step onto the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. <laughs> Pilgrimage comes with its challenges, and the Christian life is hard. I love what G.K. Chesterton says, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. You see, people don't necessarily leave the Christian faith because they've actually engaged the Christian faith, but they've tried to engage the Christian faith and found it too difficult. Too often the church has painted this picture of the Christian life that is easy and full of blessing. As though you become a Christian, suddenly your life gets better, right? Or as though all your problems go away. That's the, the core of the prosperity gospel that we often will hear on, on television or with the televangelist preachers. They, they preach a theology of glory, right? If you just turn to Christ, your life, all your problems, they go away. But the gospel and the Psalms show us something different. The gospel and the Psalms, they show us a theology of the cross, that following Jesus means carrying the cross. How Jesus says in the Gospels, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But we're reminded that the yoke of Christ is the cross. My yoke is easy, my burden is light, yet the yoke that Christ carries is the cross. And the cross is only easy and light because it's the cross of Christ. And the cross that we pick up is the cross of Christ. It's the cross of grace. But it's still the cross. Jesus tells his disciples, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. In this world, you will have trouble, he says, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. See, our, our pilgrimage as Christians can be full of dangers. We have the spiritual attacks that come, or we can experience, even as Christians, loss and suffering and heartache and distress. Like the Hebrew pilgrim we, who sets out on this great adventure toward the city of God, the thief still comes to steal and kill and destroy. The enemy of our souls comes to turn us away from the path that we're on, and we can struggle against sin, and sometimes we stumble, and sometimes we fall. And we especially feel that in this desert experience of the season of Lent. I mean, have you started into your spiritual disciplines in this season and find them hard to do? Or you start into your spiritual disciplines and you're, you're setting high goals and expectations for yourself to fulfill, and yet you find that you can't carry it all the way through. This is why we need songs for the road. <laughs> this is why we need this psalm that describes God's providence for us. It reminds us that God's help is near. 
When we look at this psalm, the first opening line is this, I lift up my, high, my eyes to the hills, from where does my help come? <laughs> we can picture the Hebrew pilgrim making his journey to Jerusalem, and as he's journeying, he sees all of these risks. He finds that the, there are rumors of robbers just ahead, or he sees the, the difficulties of traveling on that path that leans just over that cliff, or the stumbling blocks that are in front of him. And he looks around, and he's looking for help. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? You can envision him looking up to those hills, which would have been high places of pagan worship. Right? You remember in the Old Testament, these places, these high places, are often places of pagan worship. And you can think about all the kinds of things that would have happened in those high places and you get a picture of that in 1 Kings 18 with the prophets of Baal who, who are going around the altar and they're slashing themselves and they're dancing and they're crying, crying out and they're wailing, trying to arouse their God, their false God, Baal, to come and take notice of their worship. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Is that where my help comes from? See, in the Christian life, we may be tempted to look for help in things that actually pull us away from God rather than looking to God Himself. We can look to the false gods. We can look to our distractions or we can look to our addictions. We can look to our, our phones, our internet, the cable news on television or entertainment, relationships, substance abuse, money, reputation, social status, all these things, a host of things, all these things that promise a good life or they promise happiness or they're a way to numb the pain that we feel inside or they're a way to fill the emptiness we all carry but they are false gods. Only God can satisfy. Only God is our help. And we see this in verse 2. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The maker of heaven and earth. It's interesting, as we look through the psalm, the personal name of God is used five times in this psalm. That's where you have the word Lord in all capital letters, L-O-R-D. That signifies the divine name of God, the di divine name Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, -H, the tetragrammaton, we call it, the sacred name of God, which was revealed to Moses at the burning bush. This is the God of covenant relationship. This is the God who comes to His people, and He has concern for His people. He cares for His people. And we see that repeated throughout this psalm five times, once in verse 2, twice in verse 5, again in verse 7 and verse 8. The Lord, the divine name, this personal name, is revealed. He is the God of covenant loyalty. But then we also see that accompanying the, the personal name of the Lord is, is this identifier of the Lord as the one who keeps or the one who guards. And we see that in several places as well, six times in the psalm, verse 3 and verse 4 and 5, twice in verse 7 and verse 8. The Lord is your keeper. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. See, the Lord recognizes that there is this journey <laughs> that is full of trial, this journey that is full of risk that we might be tempted to look to the hills, that we might be tempted to go after those false gods, to go after the distractions, or to go after those addictions, or to go back into those things that make those false promises, the land of Meshech and the land of Kedar again. We might be, might be tempted to fall back into the land of deceit. But the Lord stands there with us on that path, and He says, I am the Lord your keeper. And He is the one who walks with us on this pilgrim path. He is the one who keeps you, and He does not sleep. He does not slumber. 
He is the one who keeps you. He provides shade for you on your right hand so that the sun does not strike you by day nor the moon by night, the, the risk of sunstroke to the pilgrim, but also the risk of, of the, the, the false delusions of moon worship that would have been happening in that time as well. The Lord is your keeper. He will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore, when you go back to your home and you come back to worship, when you go back to the field and you come back to your home, the Lord keeps you as you go out and as you come in. Always the Lord goes with you. Maybe you find this season of Lent especially challenging. You know, maybe you've grown up in the church, you've been through this process of 40 days and of prayer and fasting many times, and you know the, the disciplines of the church, taking up your Bible and reading on a regular basis every day, uh, and, and having a greater focus on prayer and, and, and just this inner attention, this awareness of God's presence. You're coming to worship more regularly throughout this season of Lent. All of those things, maybe though, you find this to be a season that's especially challenging. Maybe you find that you've set high goals and you're, you've made good progress for a while, but then failure happens. Or there's a complete collapse back into those same sins again. Maybe in the season of Lent, you find yourself discouraged, unsure of whether or not you can keep walking this Christian life. <laughs> Maybe you're like the early Christians preparing for baptism. It's an exciting adventure, but I'm not sure if it's what I expected. Or maybe life is going well and you just need that simple reminder that all good gifts come from the Father of lights who loves and delights to give good gifts to his children. And so the Lord is our keeper and he walks with us through all of those things. Maybe you see the dark valley coming before you, the valley of the shadow of death, the darkest valley, and you need to be reminded that God is with you, that His rod and His staff, they comfort you, and that He walks with you through that darkness. Behold, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Friends, at this table... We encounter the God who comes near. At this table, we encounter the God who is our keeper. And wherever you find yourself this morning walking that path, you can come to this table and you can encounter the God who walks beside you, even in this season, the season of Lent. Lord, we celebrate you and give thanks to you this morning for your gift of grace and for your gift of love. Lord, we thank you that you have invited us into your presence, that you walk with us through dark valleys and difficult paths, that you are the God who comes near. Lord, as we engage this season of Lent more and more, may it be true that you stand beside us, and may we see that truth more and more. Help us, O oh God, to experience your grace. And may it start again right here. Amen.